Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk at general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, and Perspective Glass Cockpits, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Now, typically, we focus on safety-related topics, but I also want to include topics that capture the spirit of aviation. So today, we'll be talking with air show performer Sean D. Tucker about one of his passions, which is a high school he's created in Salinas, California, called the Bob Hoover Academy that helps students learn life skills through the metaphor of flight. Now, you've got to hear what Sean is doing because it's so inspirational. And so you don't miss next week's episode in whatever app you're listening to now. Take a moment and touch the subscribe or follow button so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. Last week in episode 246, we talked about the new Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset, which has a built-in CO monitor and frequency equalizer. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 246. And this is a listener-supported show, which means we're supported by you, not by advertising. So if you would just take a moment, think about the value you get from this show. Is there something you've learned that has really changed how you fly? Well, if so, take a moment and then sign up to become a member and support the show financially at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, the first Vision Jet parachute pull occurred, and it's probably the first time a manned jet has been lowered by a parachute. Fewer pilots are using flight service, and a man hiking in Colorado was left behind by a rescue helicopter, and we'll tell you why. All this and more, and the news starts now. From WESH.com, first vision jet parachute pull successful. Three people were injured after a Cirrus SF-50 vision jet went down in a marshy area of Osceola County, according to Osceola County Fire Rescue. The FAA is investigating. The parachute deployed right behind Josh Miller's house in Osceola, and he caught it on his security camera. I saw the plane coming in, and it crashed into the bank of my pond, and the parachute kept, like, catapulting it into the woods, Miller said. He said the wind was blowing and it was raining super hard around 3 p.m. when he saw the small plane go down. It flipped, so when it hit the bank, it flipped like end over end the first time, Miller said. Miller rushed to help the three passengers on board, two adults and a minor, but it wasn't easy. It's a swampy area with three feet of water. We could see there had been a parachute that had been deployed. We could see some signs, but we had to make access to them, said Andrew Sullivan with the Osceola County Fire Rescue. Rescue officials say the terrain is so rough where this plane crashed that they had to use chainsaws to get the underbrush cut to get to the aircraft. Miller says the parachute kept yanking the plane through the woods. Fire Rescue says the chute ended up on top of some live power lines. Miller says the man suffered a gash on his head. Quote, there were two women with him. One of them was hurt pretty badly. She had a hip injury or something like that, Miller said. And then the other girl, the younger girl, she seemed okay but was shaken. She was able to get out of the aircraft before it went into the swamp. All three were taken to local hospitals for further treatment. According to FlightAware, the small plane took off in South Florida at 2.13 p.m. and was headed to Kissimmee Gateway Airport. He just told me he was headed into Kissimmee and they diverted him, Miller said. Now, I've looked at the NextRad radar and it shows heavy precipitation just slightly west of the instrument approach that the Vision Jet was flying into Kissimmee. I'll talk more about the SF-50's parachute, which is very different from the ones used in the SR-20s and SR-22s, after the news in the update segment. From GeneralAviationNews.com, fewer pilots using flight service for pre-flight weather planning. AOPA's annual weather survey shows that fewer pilots are calling flight service for pre-flight weather briefings, instead relying on apps and even general weather sites such as Windy. As more online weather resources emerge, pilots are more likely to conduct self-guided pre-flight briefings, the AOPA report notes. This led the FAA to release Advisory Circular 91-92 in 2021, to provide guidance for pilots on proper self-briefing procedures and to provide references to the many online sources of government-provided weather, NOTAMs, and airspace status. However, AOPA's 2022 weather survey found that a whopping 68% of pilots have never heard of or are only slightly familiar with the advisory circular. One trend identified in the 2022 survey was that there has been little change over the past six years the survey has been conducted in the resources pilots turn to for weather data in initial briefings immediately prior to flight and during the cruise phase of flight. Pilots in the continental U.S. primarily use aviation apps and flight service more than any other resources, although the use of flight services decreased 20% in the last five years. Pilots in Alaska turned to FAA weather cameras and flight service specialists for their pre-flight weather information, according to the survey results. 
One change the report does note is the increased use of non-aviation-related weather resources such as windy.com. Researchers hypothesize that pilots are drawn to the weather visualization and design that these platforms use. And in other findings from the study, the submission rate for unsolicited PIREPs has largely remained unchanged from prior years. However, there appears to be a direct correlation between increased submission rates and PIREP instruction during primary pilot training. FAA and the industry should continue to pursue additional methods of submitting PIREPs, but should also emphasize instruction to new pilots on PIREP submission. And roughly two-thirds of respondents use the dial-in option via phone to access ASOS and AWOS, often due to the lack of internet connectivity or for convenience while driving to the airport. The FAA should maintain the dial-in options for ASOS and AWOS. And the article contains a link to the full 45-page survey, which you can find in our show notes. From fearoflanding.com, which is a blog site, fatal crash of LSA at Santa Monica Airport. A light sport aircraft crashed last week onto the runway at Santa Monica Airport in California. The aircraft was a two-seat CSA sport cruiser. The sport cruiser belonged to a flight school, and initial reports are that a 15-year-old was on a discovery flight with a CFI and that they were returning to land. The author then describes the ATC audio and says, Relatively early on, we hear the flight instructor tell the controller that they are inbound to land full stop. Then the controller clears a King Air for takeoff and asks the inbound flight, to report the King Air in sight. Once the CFI has confirmed that they have the King Air in sight, the controller cautions against wake turbulence and asks the inbound flight to maintain visual separation with the King Air. The controller clears the flight for the option, and the CFI reads back the clearance. As the King Air becomes established in the climb about two minutes after takeoff, the controller asks the departing aircraft to change to the departure frequency. The next broadcast is of incoherent sounds and a voice clearly shouting, let go, let go, let go. The author said in her blog that the audio was disturbing and I haven't listened to it. She continues, from there it's a jumble of calls until the controller, who seems to be clinging to his professionalism by a thread, explains to an inbound flight that there has been a crash on the field and that the airport is going to be closed for quite a while. The aircraft burned to the ground and there wasn't much left of it. So it's unclear from this report whether wake turbulence was involved or if it was simply a student on their first flight who pulled back on the controls and wouldn't let go. Regardless, I think the takeaway for CFIs is that we should all take a moment and think about what you might do if you were to encounter a student who won't release the controls. From coloradoan.com, and this comes from listener Ted Rogers, investigators ask public for photos, a video of a plane that crashed near Horsetooth Reservoir. Two people suffered minor injuries after the small plane they were flying crashed near Horsetooth Reservoir on Sunday, and investigators are asking the public to share any photos or videos of the plane with them. Reports of the single-engine fixed-wing plane crashing in the Sawmill Trail area west of Horsetooth Reservoir came in at about 7 p.m. By the time deputies arrived, two adults had already gotten out of the plane, the sheriff's office said, and both were taken to a hospital for treatment of what appeared to be only minor injuries from the crash. In a related story a few days later from CBSNews.com, pilots seen flying at boats at Horsetooth Reservoir before crash. After a CBS News Colorado report highlighted the Larimer County Sheriff's Office request for images of the flight, people started turning over their images and videos to investigators. One photographer, Stephanie Stamos, said, I was at Horsetooth during a photo shoot for a high school senior. All of a sudden, I see this plane that was coming in so low. In her images, you can see the pilot seemingly target boats that were in the water. The plane swoops down right toward a boat and comes within feet of hitting it before banking to the right to buzz another pontoon boat. He was so close to the boats, I thought he was going to hit the boats. And when you see the picture, it was even closer than I thought it was. His wheel was almost right on top of the boat, and you can see the person in the boat with her hands up, Stamos said. And I've looked at the photos, and yes, the wheel of the plane appears to be just a few feet above one of the boats that had buzzed. Stamos recalled seeing the pilot bank back and forth before climbing up and over the foothills. She didn't know the plane later crashed until seeing a CBS report, but said she wasn't shocked to hear it did. I'm not surprised, Stamos said. Stamos said after witnessing the flight, she felt it was necessary to send her images to the FAA and NTSB as part of their investigation. Quote, the pilot was just being an idiot. He was flying close to the water to scare people, Stamos said. The aircraft, a November 9049 Hotel, took off from the Boulder Airport about a half hour before the crash, and you can find its track on FlightAware. And frankly, this looks like a blatant violation of the FARs on minimum safe altitude, and I hope the FAA takes swift action. From aviation-safety.net, 
Falcon has rare double engine failure during its initial climb. On September 1st, after departing Pontiac Oakland County International Airport in Michigan, a Royal Air Flight, Flight RAX-7, a Dassault Falcon 20 CF, suffered a double engine failure during climb out at 14,000 feet. The flight attempted to divert to Lansing Airport, Michigan, but later radioed that they would not be able to make the runway. The controller then suggested Mason Airport, Michigan. The aircraft attempted to land on runway 28, which is just 4,000 feet long, but departed the runway. Both crew members survived. And just a month earlier, simpleflying.com had an article on the possible causes of a double engine failure. And they say perhaps the most obvious way to lose both engines is to run out of fuel, which probably was not the case here since they had just taken off. They also say an obstruction in the fuel, such as icing, reaching the engines could lead to a similar situation. This is what happened to British Airways Flight 38, which crashed on landing in Heathrow in 2008. The article also mentioned bird strikes, such as the uh, Hudson Miracle. However, that was not mentioned in this particular report. And a final potential cause they mentioned is pilot error. And they say in the stress of an emergency, pilots can make a mistake and shut down the wrong engine. Changes to procedures have made this much less likely, but it has happened. One prominent example is the Kegworth Air disaster in the UK. This involved a British Midland Boeing 737 flying from London Heathrow to Belfast in January of 1989. From pal-item.com, fog-disoriented pilot causes 2021 deadly crash after Richmond takeoff. A Richmond, Indiana pilot who died when his plane crashed in April 2021 should not have flown in that day's foggy conditions, according to the NTSB investigation. Judson J. Costello, 78, was killed by multiple blunt force injuries when his light sport aircraft crashed into a field about a half mile south of Richmond Municipal Airport, according to the NTSB's recently released final report. Costello, who was the only person aboard, had filed a VFR flight plan to Festus, Missouri, intended to continue on to Arizona to visit family. Reading from the NTSB report, the pilot obtained a weather briefing and filed a VFR flight plan a few minutes before takeoff. An airmen advisory for IFR conditions was in effect in the weather at the airport about the time of the accident, included a cloud ceiling of 200 feet above ground level and one-half mile visibility in fog. After takeoff, the airplane entered a climbing right turn and reached an altitude of approximately 2,045 feet, or about 900 feet AGL, with a right bank angle of about 40 degrees. The airplane continued in a right turn and began to descend. Its bank angle ultimately reached about 90 degrees, and the average descent rate during the final portion of the flight was about 2,000 feet per minute. The airplane impacted an open field about a half mile south southwest of the airport and was destroyed by a post-impact fire. The pilot held a student pilot certificate, and he did not hold a medical certificate. The pilot enrolled in the private pilot training program at Sporty's Academy in June 2017. He subsequently purchased a Luscom and transitioned to the sport pilot training program. He soloed as part of that program. In May 2018, the pilot was involved in a hand-propping accident with the Luscom. The pilot withdrew from the Sporty Academy training program after that accident. The pilot was issued a limited-duration third-class FAA medical in September 2019, which expired in September 2020. He was not eligible to use a driver's license medical for medical certification due to withdrawal of his special issuance on October 27, 2020. Probable cause, the non-instrument rated pilot's intentional flight into instrument meteorological conditions, which resulted in spatial disorientation and loss of airplane control. From AviationPros.com, NTSB reveals clues in 2019 Lansing plane crash that killed five. A single-engine airplane that went down near Lansing in 2019, killing five men from Indiana, was operating overweight and out of balance, the NTSB found. The plane, a single-engine turboprop, Sakata TBM 700C2, that seat six, was overweight by more than 230 pounds when it took off from Indy South Greenwood Airport in Greenwood, Indiana on October 3, 2019, the report found. At takeoff, the aircraft was about 232 pounds over the maximum allowable takeoff weight and about 2.3 inches past the aft CG limit, the report found. At impact, the airplane was about 126 pounds over the maximum allowable landing weight and 2.95 inches past the aft center of gravity limit. A tail-heavy airplane would be more difficult to control, according to the FAA. The crash occurred at 8.58 a.m. during the plane's descent into Capital Regional International Airport in Lansing. Data from the aircraft's final minutes of flight show that just before impact, it began to turn to the left of the runway, gain just over 10 feet of elevation, and decreased airspeed. 
The crash report included a 2014 French study that found six of 36 accidents involving the TBM-700 aircraft flew to the left of intended flight paths during the final approach and lost control at low speeds. The planes become harder to control when they roll to the left at airspeeds below 70 knots, the study found. The study said additional pilot training at slow airspeeds could help in preventing similar accidents. The last ADSB data recorded showed the aircraft speed dropped to 74 knots, about a third of a mile west of the runway threshold. From GeneralAviationNews.com, first flight after maintenance ends after pilot hears tapping sound. This comes from an ASRS report written by the pilot. He wrote, first flight after aircraft maintenance performed, aircraft run-up performed normally, on climb-out, a loud tapping was heard and suspected to come from the front of the Sundowner 23. As this was the first flight since maintenance, it was suspected that something may be wrong with the engine, although power appeared normal. The precautionary landing was successful, however, touchdown was further down the runway than anticipated, and the aircraft came to a stop in the grass a few feet past the end of the paved runway. No injuries, no damage to the aircraft or anything on the ground. Aircraft taxied back to the taxiway and inspected. It was determined that an unused seatbelt was hanging out the door, creating the tapping sound as the metal end tapped against the fuselage in the windstream. Also from GeneralAviationNews.com, pilot crashes after turning into Wrong Canyon. This comes from an NTSB report. The pilot reported that while climbing at 500 feet per minute over mountainous terrain near Stanley, Idaho, he made a right turn into the Wrong Canyon. Realizing his mistake and unable to make a course reversal, the terrain was rising faster than the 172 could climb. He attempted a left-hand turn to try for lower terrain. However, the airplane stalled and entered a spin. He regained control and put the airplane in level flight just before hitting trees. Both wings were substantially damaged. The pilot and his passenger sustained minor injuries. The pilot reported that there were no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions with the aircraft or engine that would have precluded normal operation. Probable cause, the pilot's failure to maintain terrain clearance after flying into the wrong canyon in mountainous terrain, which resulted in a collision with trees and terrain. And finally, from CBSNews.com, man lost in Colorado wilderness, left behind by rescue helicopter. A crew called 911 for help Wednesday morning after someone from a hunting party didn't come back to camp Tuesday night, somewhere between Surprise Lake and Upper Cataract Lake. Flight for Life made a quick scouting mission, but wasn't able to find the man. They loaded up a hiker and called for a Black Hawk helicopter filled with seven other hiking search and rescue members from Summit Rescue Group, as well as sending a few crew members on the trail to search for the lost man. According to rescue crews, the hunters were off trail in swampy, dense foliage, so the ground search was taking time. Thankfully, the Black Hawk pilot spotted someone they believed could be the missing man. He radioed that they had a subject that partially matched the description, but not completely, only because his backpack was upside down so it was the wrong color, explained Summit County Rescue Group's Anna De Batiste. The real key here is that he went like this, De Batiste said, slowly waving one hand casually. The pilot said, he's saying hi, he doesn't seem to be in distress, and so they left, she said. Thankfully, ground crews were able to find the man shortly afterwards, but it was an educational moment Summit County Rescue Group wanted to take advantage of. What he actually should have done was something like this, De Batiste said, waving aggressively with both arms over her head back and forth over and over again, or waving a brightly colored piece of clothing, something to say, hey, I'm the guy you're looking for. Crew said they found the man cold, tired, and dehydrated, but otherwise fine. They said he did do the right thing, staying in one spot overnight, then trying to get to a more open area in daylight to help crews find him. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And then we'll hear from Sean Tucker about his Bob Hoover Academy, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now for a few updates. I don't think I have any new check rides to report under our good news department. So if you've recently passed a check ride, please send a note and let me know. Let me talk about the Vision Jet parachute pull. You know, I thought that it would probably be many years before we had our first parachute pull, mainly because most of the time these aircraft are flying long stranded approaches after an instrument approach as compared to SR-20s and SR-22s, which are instead flying a regular traffic pattern most of the time and occasionally lose control in the traffic pattern. Well, we did have a parachute pull on the Vision Jet. appears to have been weather-related. Now, this was a 2018 aircraft, so that was a fairly early one, the uh, so-called G1 version. 
that version did not have the auto throttle. And if you look at the airspeeds, they really are pretty much all over the place. There was a climb at the very end of the ADSB data. I believe it uh, zipped up from about 2,200 to about 3,100 feet. That climb at the end was almost certainly commanded by the autopilot after the caps was pulled. The parachutes in the SR-20 and the SR-22, those deploy immediately when you pull the handle. However, the SF-50 is very different. It's actually the autopilot which manages the deployment after you pull the handle. So after the handle is pulled, the autopilot's caps mode retards the throttle back to idle and it pitches the aircraft up 30 degrees, which is pretty steep. That's meant to slow the aircraft and it strives to get the airspeed below either 135 knots indicated or 145 knots true airspeed, whichever is less before deploying the parachute. Also, if it's unable to do that after 32 seconds have elapsed, the parachute deploys anyway. And certainly if I learned anything more about the circumstances under which the handle was pulled, I'll pass that along. And this week, the NTSB released the preliminary report of the Watsonville mid-air collision that we talked about a few weeks ago here on this show. There is really nothing new in the report in terms of uh, new information. However, there was something rather interesting, which is that there's a photograph that was taken apparently by a witness who said that they took the photo from their office window. And that photo shows the two aircraft within a fraction of a second of colliding with each other. You can see the uh, twin engine aircraft, the Cessna 340, is in a right bank. And you can see the uh, Cessna immediately right in front of it. It looks to me like from the perspective that it was taken from the terminal building. So perhaps uh, an airport uh, ops person took it from their uh, office there. Anyway, just an amazing photo and, of course, a very, very sad situation. And as we hear more about this accident, we'll certainly pass that along, too. Now, here's a note from Dr. Dylan Caldwell. As a follow-up, he said, Hi, Max. I listened to the episode about the DPE shortage and CFI etiquette. One easy and simple way to make things better for everyone is for CFIs to ensure their students document their name properly on all FAA paperwork. The names on the FAA forms must match their photo ID exactly, and this includes middle names. I know of more than a few cases in which a DPE refused a student pilot's check ride because the student's medical certificate was missing the middle name, which was on the photo ID. Thanks for sending that along, Dylan. And yes, I have heard that as well, and that's something that I work very carefully to make sure with my clients uh, everything matches. So just to drill down on this a little bit more, Probably the first thing you're going to apply for is your student pilot certificate. And you probably do want to make sure that that name matches the ID that you plan to use, whether it's your passport or your driver license. And you want to match the middle name exactly to your um, your ID. So, for example, if your passport or your driver license shows your full middle name, then include the full middle name. If it includes just an initial for the middle name, include just the initial. So literally you want everything to match on your student pilot certificate, your written, when you take the written exam, your medical, and of course, uh, all those items have to match. Now, if for some reason you're partway into the process and they don't match, there are ways to fix these things, but they do take time. For example, on the uh, pilot certificate, you'll need to go to your local FISDO and they will make a name change for you. On your medical, you've got to go back to the doctor who issued the medical and they will make that change. I'm not sure how you get a written exam name changed, but in any case, it really makes sense to think about all of this before you start accumulating uh, these certificates and documents so that you make sure that all of the names are consistent. And today I was out giving flight instruction when we were doing unusual attitudes, and it reminded me of when I was back in the simulator in the Vision Jet uh, a year ago when I was doing my annual recurrent training. I had just done uh, unusual attitudes as part of my check ride. And the sim instructor complimented me on them, and he said uh, that they were really quite good. And I said to him, oh, is that something that pilots have difficulty with? And he said, yes, definitely. So I thought I'd go ahead and review for you what the FAA says we should be doing for unusual attitudes. And you're going to find these on many check rides, including the uh, private check ride and the instrument check ride. It's a three-step process, and you want to do three separate distinct steps. You don't want to mash all these things together and do them simultaneously. So once you look up and you determine that, for example, 
the nose is up and your airspeed is slowing, you want to go to full power. Then you're going to push the nose down to the horizon. And then lastly, after you get the nose down to the horizon, you're going to level the wings. And the reason you push the nose down before leveling the wings is that if the nose is pointed up and if you're hovering on the edge of a stall, the ailerons are not going to be very effective. So by pushing the nose down, that increases the airspeed, prevents you from stalling, puts more wind over the ailerons, which means they'll be more effective when you level the wings last. And of course, then you want to resume normal cruise power and stay at whatever altitude you're at when you finish the maneuver. The FAA doesn't want you changing altitudes in a cloud because you might uh, bump into somebody else in the cloud. And of course, the other unusual attitude would be with the nose down with airspeed increasing. Power comes all the way off because you certainly don't want to get to the ground any sooner. You then need to roll the wings level and then raise the nose up to the horizon and resume cruise power. The reason you don't want to start to just pull back before leveling the wings is you could tighten up into a spiral. So that's unusual attitudes. Next time you practice them, think of them as three distinct separate steps. And let me tell you about a fun trip that I have coming up this coming weekend. I'll be leaving on Saturday, flying from San Francisco to Newark on United commercially. And then on Sunday morning, I head up to Lincoln Park Airport where my client who's just purchased a Turbo 206 and I will pick up that aircraft and start to bring it back across the country. So we've been doing a little work ahead of time uh, planning for that. And what I plan to do is record some of our pre-flight planning and then post that audio on Patreon so that anybody who's a Patreon supporter can listen to some of our conversations as we talk about exactly what we're going to be doing and some of the logistics for this particular trip. I started looking at the weather hmm, probably a full week in advance, looking at the uh, GFS charts that I mentioned uh, last week in episode 246. Things didn't change much on the eastern side of the country over the last five days, but they've changed quite a bit on the western side. So the whole entire time I've been looking at the weather, it looks like we're going to have pretty good weather leaving from New Jersey. But on the west coast, a storm which didn't show up when I first started looking at this is now showing up. And of course, even the local weather reports are now talking about it. They expect to have uh, as much as 1.5 inches of rain in some parts of the San Francisco Bay Area, which would be a lot of rain for us for one storm. So that's certainly going to affect our route planning as well. So again, if you're a Patreon supporter, check in, and I'm hoping to post some of our audio conversations about that trip. And certainly uh, the next week when I'm back, I'll tell you a little bit about the trip as well. Now here's an email from Scott Cody Mattiello. He says, good evening, Max. I've been an avid listener for many years and have always looked up to you. Well, that, that's kind of you. Thank you. He says, I'm a 36-year-old maintenance facility manager for a large manufacturing plant in southern New England. It's a stressful job needing me to work 55 hours a week plus countless after-hour calls and stressing about breakdowns. My son is getting to the age he will need to be brought to school at different hours and being on the spectrum will need being brought to special needs classes and a normal schedule will not work for us. My wife has decided to go back to work full-time and after many years of traveling work and stressful jobs, my wife is pushing me to do something I love and get my CFI and instruct full-time for local flight school, one of many within 30 minutes of my home. I'm considering offering up my beautiful 1974 Piper Warrior on leaseback to the flight school to offset my drop-in income till I get established. I love teaching and know it will be rough at times. Corporate or charter might be in my very long-term future, but I really want to strive to be a great instructor that teaches rather than just trying to build time. My wife and family, including my pilot father, are pushing me to follow my dreams. I'm working with a flight school to set up a plan, so as soon as I leave my job, I will start preparing for my CFI checkride as a lesson once a week when Abel is not cutting it. They have already told me they will put me to work as a CFI as they are bleeding instructors to the major airlines the day after my ride. You've been a guiding voice in my aviation life and now career. Wish me luck and thank you for everything you do for the aviation community. Signed, Cody. Well, Cody, congratulations. I really hope you enjoy teaching. I got to tell you, I have a heck of a lot more fun uh, teaching than I did when I was working in the corporate world. But, you know, it is a job. So there will still be times where <laughs> you find it a little bit to try. But uh, I said to somebody recently, I think the worst day teaching is probably better than most of my days uh, when I was working in the corporate world. So good luck to you and stay in touch with us. And I also wanted to read an email from someone who's just signed up to support the show at the $200 a month level. That's the mentor level. 
We limit the number of those uh, supporters that we can have. We only have three at the moment. This gentleman asked to remain anonymous, but I really loved his email, so I wanted to share it with you. He says, thank you for your response to my membership. My contribution is long overdue as I've been an avid listener for over two years. Here's a little background on me. I'm a 62-year-old small business owner in Cleveland. I live in a rural community to the southwest of Cleveland, Ohio, and fly. And he mentions a particular airport. I started the process of becoming a pilot in January 2021 and received my private in September 2021. I started my instrument quest in March of 2022, and I have a checkride schedule for October 5th. I currently have 230 hours in the logbook. I own a Piper Archer with a partner that just had an upgrade of avionics. Unfortunately, the plane is in the shop now with some engine trouble. My mission is simply the love of flying. An occasional weekend trip with my wife and a $100 hamburger on the weekends is simply what I want to keep on doing. My long-term goal is to get my CFI and teach a bit in retirement. My reason for the support of your podcast is twofold. One, I simply want to give back to you for your efforts. I truly believe that you've made me a safer pilot. Your weekly show is a bright spot in my week. During my journey to become a private pilot, your show was helpful almost weekly with some topics currently on my mind. I really enjoy the mock check rides. Secondly, I've been successful in life by surrounding myself with people that are smarter than me. I would love to use a few minutes of your time once a month, either on the phone or through email, to get an unbiased opinion on my training process and possibly to pick your brain around my next plane purchase. I truly believe that spending $200 per month to tap into your wife of knowledge is the deal of the century. And he mentioned that he's budgeted to support the show at that level for the coming year. We've already had a fun phone call and I'm looking forward to helping him with his journey, which sounds very, very exciting. So thanks so much for signing up to support the show. And now see if you know any of these people who've just signed up in the last week to support the show. At the $35 a month level, Peter Como, so he gets access to my online courses. And at the $20 a month level, Chuck Knuth and Daniel Snedeker. And at the $8 a month level, JJ Suarez. Thank you so much for your donations. We have some one-time PayPal donations. Aaron George donated $50 and Kevin Vadrine donated $25. Thank you both so much for your contributions. And if you're interested in becoming a member to help support the show, just head out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, which will take you to our Patreon site where you can choose the dollar level at which you'd like to support the show and see what goodies you'll get for the different dollar levels. Or for a one-time donation, just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. Thanks so much for your support. Coming up next, you don't want to miss this conversation with Sean D. Tucker, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let me tell you a little about Sean D. Tucker. Sean is a world champion aerobatic aviator, and he was sponsored for many years by the Oracle Corporation and performed in air shows as Team Oracle. He's won numerous air show championship competitions, and he was named one of the 25 living legends of flight by the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. He currently serves as co-chairman of EAA's Young Eagle program, but as you'll hear in a moment, he gets most excited about the high school he started, the Bob Hoover Academy in Salinas, California. And now here's our conversation with Sean Tucker. Sean, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Honest to God, this is going to be fun because we're talking about stuff I certainly love and I know you do as well. And that's the sky. And that's also putting kids in the sky. Exactly. Well, people probably know you best as an air show performer. And yet you've done something that's pretty unusual. You've created a high school to help youth that are at risk in Monterey County. Uh, tell us about the city of Salinas and why you're so passionate about this. Oh, golly, um, I've been in the Salinas Valley for oh, over 40 years. Um, I started my aviation career as a crop duster and it, working in Watsonville. I went to uh, when I was going to junior college, I was a, a, a loader, they called them, um, loading the, the pesticides into the into the hoppers of the Stearmans. And then I learned to fly Stearmans and became a, a crop duster. And number one, I dig farmers, but I really saw who really does the heavy lifting, and that's the Hispanic community. Um, I just, culturally, I just think they're wonderful people. They, they love their families. They work so hard, and they bet on America. And what I mean by that is they came here like all the other immigrants that came here from uh, 
the Italians and the Polish people, the Irish, uh, the English, the Jewish people, and they all started in gutter. But they're betting on America because they believe there's a better future for their children. And the Hispanic com community has done that. And there was a have had a serious, significant gang problem in Salinas. In fact, we were equal to Chicago per capita on kid-on-kid -kid murders, shootings. And it just breaks my heart. I mean, these are the hard, hard work of people living two to three families to a household, sending money back to, to Mexico, trying to, to raise their kids here so they could have a better future for themselves. And they can rise above where they are. And that's what's so great about this country. I've traveled all around the United States of America for decades, sharing the magic of flight, inspiring people, thrilling people, educating people. And we come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. We come from all cultures. But for some reason, people just resonate with the third dimension and watching an airplane fly on all axes in the third dimension. And I just feel this metaphor is so powerful and strong. I felt that if I gave this to my at-risk community, the kids that are in trouble, the kids that are in gangs, I'll help them build some self-esteem. I'll help them face their fears, build some courage. And um, I think it could change their lives. And we've proven it. And it's working. It's been 10 years in the program. I started with my son. We started with the probation department. And we've matured now to we have our own high school. It's very small. It's currently right now, It's um, we serve the at-risk community. Uh, but we don't call them at-risk anymore because who wants to go to school with at-risk? So we call them at-promise just to change the whole, whole equation. And we're thriving. And when I say we're thriving, it's just really small. Right now, we, we have 13 students. We have a capacity for 40, but it's one kid at a time. I got kids now who are, um, they're pilots, who, but they're making money working on for, for FedEx. I got kids in the Marine Corps. I got kids in the Army and the Navy. I got kids who just have really good jobs and, and are good fathers and good husbands and taxpayers. And and it, it takes a lot of heavy lifting. There's not like this magic pixie dust that you throw on them and all of a sudden their problems are solved. It's heavy lifting but with loving adults being involved and, sh and, and allowing them to believe in themselves. And now, because we have our new campus open and I have a capacity for 40 for the vocational program and academic program, I get to recruit to the community. And so the goal is to reach you to the Hispanic community coming from loving families. And I really believe those kids are going to help inspire the ones that are having a tough time. And so that's the next experiment. And I'm really looking forward to it. And, but I, you know, like I said, one kid at a time. And I just adore these rascals. And believe me, they're rascals. <laughs> but I, I certainly was a rascal. And I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and incorrigible, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, if I hadn't found something I love so much as in flight, I'd be in a uh, dire straits. And so it's, it's, you know, our metaphor and what we love about flying transmits to everybody and to allow somebody to take the journey and open a door for them and let them see what's possible is really a gift. And I feel I've been very, very much gifted to have this opportunity to, to um, number one, have the school, but name it after a man I respect very much, Mr. R.A. Bob Hoover, who was a dear friend. He was a mentor, a colleague, and just to keep his core values alive. The kids don't know, you know, they don't really know Bob Hoover, but they, they're so proud to say they go to the Bob Hoover Academy. It's, it's, it's really cool. Well, I certainly share your passion. I get down to Watsonville, which is close by Salinas, a couple times a month. And as I drive through the fields and see literally 100 people out there working, I know it's backbreaking work. And I know it's just a real challenge for youth to make sure that they're really on the straight and narrow. Uh, so talk about the original program, the Every Kid Can Fly program. I think that was an after-school program. Why was that a little bit less successful than having a dedicated high school? 
we couldn't spend enough time with the kids. It was run by the probation department. They treated the kids and the kids got in trouble, but they treated them like they're troubled kids. And so the, the energy, they, they were kind of wards of the court. And I was just disappointed that it was too institutional for me. It was not, I, 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 when I, when I receive a child, I, I do not want to judge them on their past. I want to judge them on their now and, and their future. And it was just really hard to reach them. Um, they'd come at two 30, they, they're already tired. Um, they are, they want to go home and I just couldn't get the buy-in that I needed by the entire community because it takes, it takes more than just Sean Tucker with a bunch of passion. I have these magnificent volunteers who really, I mean, retired airline, airline pilots who, who train in the simulator. We have back here, this Redbird full motion simulator that was donated to us by Redbird. And I have a lot of people who, I think, I think the adult to child ratio is probably three or four to one. Besides the teacher, we have a behavioral psychologist. I have an administrator. My flight instructors are absolutely the best. I pay them more than they can make anywhere else. I guarantee them their time. They all get paid two hours for, for every hour they fly. So they know they get paid the same amount for ground and the same amount for flying because I, I, I value them. And so we, we really put our arms around these children. We treat these children like they're our children. And we give them that kind of love. And it changes them. I, they, they trust us. They come in. When we open the door, this is their new tribe. This is their new family. And we're all in this together. And that's what's important. So it's a very intimate setting. And and what's really nice now, and I have, and, it, and Monterey County Office of Education, this is a public-private partnership. And they're taking big risks with their careers by this is because you know we what's what what's the upside and what's the downside when you when you're teaching a kid to fly okay and they're taking a big risk but they see the success we have the highest graduation ratio lowest recidivism less truancy than any other program they have and they bet on it and they bet big and and we really have to put all our effort in and and each kid is a precious jewel and that's what we consider them to be. Uh, each single kid when they come there, and they're, and it takes time, but they slowly wake up. They slowly start looking in the mirror and and believe that they do have a future. They be, they do have a passion. They can talk to people about facing their fears. I mean, at the end of the day, this stuff's scary. It's scary to take an airplane up for the first time in your life. It's scary to get into turbulence. It's scary to stall an airplane. And we just do it baby steps. We can ha- enable them to, to face their fears and com- conquer their fears little by little, just inch by inch every single day. It grows and they become powerful. And, and the kids, when the light bulbs come off, they don't, they don't back up because it's the first time in their life that they start to have some self-esteem through the metaphor flight, through care and loving adults who really care about these children. I understand you've got two major components. You've got the high school, which is funded and uh, staffed by the Monterey County. And of course, you've got Bob Hoover Academy. The two work very tightly together. How does a typical day or typical week look like for one of the students? How they get how much time they spend in one place versus the other and so on? Well, you know, it's really wonderful now. I mean, absolutely wonderful. It's not an after school program. From 930 to 1230, it's all academics to get them to graduate from high school. Because at the end of the day, we want them to graduate from high school. That's the number one thing. And then from 2.30 to 5 is is the flying portion and the vocational piece. And so I get them for five hours. And it's amazing how, uh, excuse me, from 12.30 to 5, I, I get them. But it's so amazing how the... The, and we get, some of them go to the sim, uh, some go to the vocational instruction part where they're learning how to work on things and others go flying and we, and we rotate. Okay. But it's amazing. They like to stay. They don't mind staying after school when they're flying. Okay. And, and now that we're at the airport in the world war two hangar, 
it's their community. It's it's their home. So they walk, we open the door for them, we welcome them, we, and that's their whole day, and that's their community, and it's safe. And I understand you've got some new facilities that have just been built. Tell us about that and what that's going to enable you to do. Well, that's what this, oh, golly. Before, we had a little um, one-room classroom about a mile and a half away, and the kids walked here to take the flight lessons. And then we started this project at, at uh, the World War II hangar, and we have a one quarter of the World War II hangar. I think it's about 6,000 square feet of hangar space and then another 4,000 square feet of classroom space, but we have to renovate it. And unfortunately, it was built in the 40s, you know, right, right during World War II, and so there was a lot of unforeseen delays in it. It took almost a year and a half. And and we had gotten rid of our lease on our one room school building and they were they were in midtown uh, East Salinas, three or four miles away, and they would have to transport the kids back to the airport to fly every day. Now it's here. We're intimate. It's their classroom. They own it. They walk into the classroom, their pictures are on their wall. They're superstars. It's a game changer. It's absolutely a game changer. So it sounds Who like wouldn't want to be at the airport every single day. And, and as you know, living in cent- the central California coast, it's beautiful every single day. I mean, so who would have want that to be your backyard and your playground? It's called the runway. Yeah, I love the Salinas Airport. I often take flight students down there. It's always cool. And we've got uh, big runways and a nice restaurant there. So it sounds like everything is right together now. And is that allowing you to expand? Do you now have capacity for more students? And how are you going to find them? Well, number one, we're, we're recruiting. We're going to have open houses. I'm looking for 25 students who appreciate the opportunity that we're offering them. It's, I, I, you know, for me, it, um, it, I, I firmly believe it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or what color your skins. If you live in this country, your dreams are valid. And I want to offer this to, to the Hispanic community, uh, the poor Hispanic community, because their dreams are valid. And it's it's all about, I, I really feel strongly about it, social justice. It, it's all about, <sighs> aviation has been very inclusive, Okay. It's, or it's, should I say exclusive? And and I want I, I, we can change that. And this is my demographic of my community. We're seventy two percent Hispanic, and so I want to reach the, the Hispanic community. Talk a little bit about the staff that you have on the Bob Hoover side of the uh, equation. I have great staff. I I the, my flight instructors are right at the peak of their flight instructing career before they burn out, before they just want to get to the airlines. Um, they really care about the students. We, we, we brief every week with the behavioral psychologist on how everything's going. We talk about how their training's going and what we need to work on and use flight as that metaphor for also life lessons. And, and so that, that's, a, that's wonderful to have that opportunity to really dig deep into the why we're teaching and into how to best connect with that young adult. My, I have an administrator, Stacy Wilson, who unfortunately she's in her last year of law school and she's going to have to move on. So I'm going to re, it's because she's going to be tough to replace. The AMP vocational instructor is magnificent. He, he's um, an AI for one of the emergency rescue helicopter services here. And he's given me 20 hours a week to work and build this vocational program. And when I mean work and build it, these kids don't know the difference between a Phillips head and a straight screwdriver. And so we really are starting to slowly build the program. But the cool news is, though, as we're building this program, this vocational piece, pretty soon we have an opportunity to, to expand and do. And once we have those tools and and, and have the, the correct recruitment, we can do a, a young adult vocational program next door in the afternoon for adults who are over 18. And that'll be a whole separate program because we, as you well know, we need AMP mechanics. And these, one of my kids, he's making 65 bucks an hour working at a FedEx paying for his own. He's working on his uh, commercial license right now. He, he's 21 years old 
And he, he was a throwaway. I mean, they, they, we used to have to draw, drag him kicking and screaming and take him to the judge and the judge told him, if you don't go to school, you're going to jail. And he hated us. And then the light bulb went and he fell in love with flying. He went to A&P school and at um, Gavilan College, uh, went to work um, for one of the regionals, got on with FedEx, has a, a new car, a beautiful girlfriend, and a poodle. And he has money to take his home flight lessons. And, and, what, and what's amazing about my alumni, when I call them up, they'll do, they are so appreciative of having the opportunity whatever i ask them to do if i ever i need them for anything they just show up and, and, and that's that yeah and you don't save every kid some kids you gotta let go but you don't ever give up on these kids because you don't know when that light bulb you 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 don't know when it starts connecting the dots get connected and so every kid is important that's a great success story Talk about your airplanes, both the ones you're flying and the ones that have been donated to you. <laughs> oh, golly, this has been fun. Uh, my first airplane was the 152. Um, uh, we still have it. And it, it, um, then we have a 1980 172 that um, is really in pretty good shape. And that is the one we're going to overhaul. And turn it into a brand new airplane. The engines run out. It hadn't flown in 10 years, but we got a ferry permit. We flew it in and the kids are working on that airplane. That airplane, they're going to watch evolve into a magnificent piece of jewelry. And the airplane has really got good bones, but it needs new paint, new interior, new glass, new engine. We got to go through all the instruments. So that's a, definitely a work in progress. I went into escrow on a one Cherokee 160 beautiful airplane but we and it's still it's still in the look you're trying to clear all the liens and so i'm kind of giving up on that airplane i bought a uh a, a sight unseen 172 and, it, and when it flew in I, on recommendation from a friend when it flew in it looked a lot worse than our project airplanes and, and the gentleman who actually gave me the money for the airplane i said i i can't this is a big too big a project and I only could afford to do one project, so I'm going to sell that airplane. He says, I understand. Well, go ahead and sell it. So I needed a, a, an annual, so I took it up uh, to get it uh, annual. And the, there was so much work that needed to be done on it, we couldn't sell it. It's unairworthy. Okay. So I called him up. I called the guy up who, who sold me the airplane. Come here, Stacy. You, you can meet my, excuse me, just a minute. My administrator just came in. This is Max. Say hi. Hi, Max. <laughs> hi, Stacey. Sorry to interrupt. I know you had this room reserved. Yeah, okay. I still ran up. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> she just joined the party. So anyway, anyway, uh, I called the guy who sold the airplane. Said, I'm sorry. You said the airplane was just Iran. It's Iran, but it's, it's full of metal, blah, blah, blah. And it's unairworthy. And I'd like my money back. He not only really gave me all my money back, he gave me the airplane. And so I was able to sell the airplane as a project to a guy who's getting an AP project. And he's he drove a trailer up from Texas, took the wings off, and is on his way to become a new airplane in about five years and two hundred thousand dollars. So I'm in the market right now for a, we need another airplane right now. Yeah, that's great. And I can imagine uh, the 152 is probably you need something a little bigger for some of the bigger kids. Yeah, and some of my bigger instructors. Okay. I mean, some of my instructors uh, they got a little too much junk in their trunk, and they got to <laughs> – so, yeah, we yeah, I, we do. actually – I think it's important to have – I love the 152 because it's so it's so unintimidating. I mean, it's just a little toy, and it's and it's so functional, and you can get in it. But, yeah, I, and so my kids are, are too big for it, so we have to rent a 172, which, unfortunately, the one we were renting just had a – catastrophic engine failure and landed on the beach in uh, uh, Watsonville. So the fleet's down to one until we find another one. But we're, we're, on the, we're in the market. Because I believe also the kids that are struggling, we can put them in the back seat of the 172 and they can watch one of their colleagues, a fellow student, thrive and learn from that, that equation. And that's what's so great about the Redbird simulator. It's two cents a minute to run the sim versus $2 a minute to run 
run one of the training aircraft. And so they can really learn a lot and we can be, we can stretch our dollar a lot more. Well, the Redbird's a good example. I understand you have a number of partners. Talk about how partners have helped you with this organization. Oh, friends, I, 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 we have really not done a major fundraiser. And my aviation friends just believe in, in our, our journey and, and our mission. And I've raised well over a million and a half dollars just by five friends and, and that people like Redbird, uh, Global Aerospace helps me with get the, the right amount of liability insurance to, to protect all the supervisors in Monterey County. And so this has been a, a collaboration with everybody in the aviation community. Without them, there's no way. And, and I really didn't want to raise any money or do an outreach till I could prove the ROI. I, I, and, and, and that was really important to me because this is, was just a dream of mine. And so my wife was really mad at me for a couple of years. <laughs> Let's put it this way. But I just believed in it so much. And so it's all been baby steps. Now that the community, the Sally Hughes Church Foundation is, uh, is, has given us grants and, and we're receiving scholarships. Harbor Freight, uh, the, the tool guy heard about it and sent me a really significant jet. Joe Clark has been very generous. Harrison Ford has been very generous. He came up and it's so great. Harrison, I was involved with him on the Young Eagle program. And what I really love about Harrison is his humility and his passion and his empathy. And he came up and met the kids, watched, watched one of our kids solo. And there's only 20 kids in the class and, and all these administrators, because Harrison were there. And the kids really don't resonate with Harrison Ford. They did, they're just young kids that, you know, Indiana Jones, we had to educate them. And it was his turn to speak to the kids, and he just started crying. And he was just so overwhelmed. And it took him 20 minutes to, to get it, to get it back together to talk to these kids. And so everybody who comes up is, is really moved by the by the agenda and and believe me it's it's um it's not easy okay and, and you have to be patient it is heavy lifting but it's so rewarding spiritually that it, 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 even if you just change one kid's life that's that's a life you change but when you have an opportunity to multiply that to every kid because they go into the community and become a vibrant member of society versus being down in desperation and, and, and they're now enabled to have a passion and, and a dream and, and they know they have tools to, and they, they can fulfill on that dream and because people believe in them. And, and if, and if you have hope, you get out of bed in the morning. If you have a dream, you get out of bed in the morning and these kids get out of bed and they come, they come and they're putting the work in here at, every single day and that and they work hard they it, it, they come the kids we're, we're working is with right now come from pretty tough circumstances and they work hard every day uh, and i am honored that i i have been able to be involved with this and i'm honored by all my dear friends who've helped me um and now we're because we have traction and we now have roi we're now do a fundraiser but we're not going to believe in our press clippings. We're going to we're going to keep doing this heavy lifting because that's what it's all about. Well, it sounds like what you're saying is that the people who donate airplanes and money really are getting back as much as they're giving to you. They're, they, it, you know, it it's really humbling. Hard Sail Propeller, um, mm -hmm. they they're just such a wonderful company. And the father, Jim Brown Senior, was a dear dear friend of mine. And then the sons took over the business and just exploded it. And they have an annual show for their employees the day after Labor Day. And since I, my, my airplane now, the red airplane's in the Smithsonian, I don't have a, I don't have a ride. <laughs> the airplane's hanging upside down. I don't have a ride. But they had me come out, and they surprised me with a $100,000 check. Okay? And I was speechless because I, I understand why they did that. And that commitment they made and the belief they have in, in this project. And 
I was almost brought to tears. I, I mean, I, I think there was a few tears. And then I had to speak to all the employees because they did it in front of the employees right after the show before the fireworks. And that's humbling to have friends like that, that, that believe in this. And, and it's humbling. But then I think how inspiring it is that aviators and, and people who understand what it represents, that, that they're that generous. Because you, every person has a good cause, and for my fellow aviators and, and friends to believe in, in in this this project is is it's so much fun and and so empowering to to want to keep doing the work. I would imagine there's probably somebody listening right now who's thinking they would love to start something like this in their own area. Do you have either a template or suggestions on how people might start something like this? If I knew it was going to be this hard, I would say, I, I don't know if I would have taken the journey. And I would love, I would help. It. Number one, it, it works. The template works, but, but it's got to be a buy-in by the community. And what I mean by that, you've got to partner with your department of education and they got to buy in. What we did, which is it took about three years working with the lawyers to protect, to protect the administrators to t- protect their careers, to make sure that they're, they're protected from the liability because it's flying. We're flying kids every single day. They're not just in Sims. That's just part of the academic classroom. And so that's a serious business. And, uh, you know, normally you can probably get a kid out in 18, 20 hours and have them solo. Our kids take about 50 hours because I want them so good. I want them. I just don't want to cross my fingers if they're having a good day. I want them so good on their worst day that I'm comfortable. And the vetting process, everybody has to agree that they're ready to solo. Number one, their 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 main instructor takes it to the other instructor. Then I have a check airman that checks checks them. And there's these steps. And I want these kids wanting to throw us out of there. They're so ready to solo because it's this is not an aviation high school. And you're going to go out and be a pilot. We're using flying as a tool to help to help you define yourself as a human being. And along, oh, by the way, a, a, along that journey, you're probably you're going to solo. And if you're really with it, you're going to get your private pilot's license. And if you're really committed, you're going to have you're going to be able to get credits towards your your A and P license because they're working. They're being instructed by an AI. But it's the entire entire journey. Talk about drug testing and the role that it plays and how motivational that is for your kids. <laughs> it's, we're not mandated to drug test, okay? But it's a tool we use to, uh, before they solo, they go get their medicals and they also take the drug test. And over 50% of them fail the drug test for marijuana. And if they fail their drug tests, they don't fly for seven weeks because that's what it takes to that's what it takes to have marijuana clear your system. It's a federal law that you can't have marijuana in your system to fly airplanes. And so if if they and some of them have failed the drug test a couple of times, that's 14 weeks. Well, now when they're they, they go to the neighborhood and they're there's because they're going to that community and their their peers are saying, here, have have uh, have a joint or have a, have a puff. They go, now they can say, no, I already got busted and I want to fly airplanes. Okay. And so we use it as a tool and it's a tool of accountability. If academically they are not making the cut, they don't buy. Can you come here just to fly? I, this is part of the curriculum. And so we're using flying as a tool to enable them to develop into viable human beings. Okay. Flying's that tool. And if that spark is lit and, and, and lights that fire and they, they move on into a career of aviation, that's great. As we grow, as I, I'm able to cr- recruit from the community and really not have to put all that time in and, and, and just to allow that kid to thrive, that's going to be a different equation. This is what I'm looking forward to is because I really believe those kids who are passionate about it and who want to be pilots, who want to be mechanics are going to come here and thrive. And they're going to, they're going to lead by example to the kids that we're doing heavy lifting with. 
Well, Sean, you're doing an amazing job, and I hope this motivates other people to get involved either with your program or with programs they start in their own area. Where do people go out to find more information about Bob Hoover Academy? Well, they can certainly come visit me in Salinas, California. And oh, I forgot to tell you, we have an AT6 Texan donated to us to give thank you rides to our donors. So come on down. Let's uh this uh let's go fly let's go fly it in the old World War II trainer, a, a trainer that Bob Hoover used to to fly in that same trainer before he flew in the P fifty one Mustang. But come on down to the airport and visit us at Salinas, California. Go to BobHooverAcademy.org and go to our website. We're still developing as we're growing. We're doing our first ribbon cut. The ribbon cutting ceremony for the new campus is September 13th at 1.30 here at Salinas Airport. Come on down then or just come visit. I mean, I'd love to show the campus. It's just, it's just fun. It's what's possible. And again, to answer your questions about this, is we could, we could replicate this. I'm not going to do it. (laughs) This is a lot of work, but I'll give you all my lessons learned. I will absolutely do do anything I can to to help you. But this is be prepared for a journey. This is, this is, there's no easy button when it comes to this, but it's worth it. Sean, thanks so much for all the great work you're doing. This has been very inspirational. Thanks for joining us here today. God bless America. And my thanks to Sean for joining us to talk with us today about the Bob Hoover Academy. You can learn more about it at bobhooveracademy.org. And if you're interested in flying with Sean or one of his instructors, you may want to find out more about the Tatima Academy of Aviation Safety located in King City, where he offers a variety of courses, including stall spin recognition, recovery training, aerobatic proficiency training, and a low-level aerobatic mentorship program. And you can find out more about that at tutimaacademy.com. And of course, I'll have links to both of these in our show notes. And my thanks to everyone who helps support the show, whether it's through your emails, the reviews that you leave on the podcast apps that you're listening to the show on now, and also for your support via Patreon and PayPal. So until next time, fly safely, have fun and keep the blue side up, unless you're Sean D. Tucker, in which case you could have any side up you'd like. <laughs>